issue of personal identity, what is myself, seems like a silly question. But if you think about it, we're so different than we used to be. Every molecule in our body is different than it was five years ago or whatever. Uh, we look differently. Yet I, I feel like I'm the same person. I remember myself in, in high school and junior high school, and, and I, I have no, no problem with this sense of personal identity. Right. What is it about our brains that create this feeling of, of self? Well, it's really advantageous that you change slowly. <laughs> because if you really could look at yourself and really could I really could assay yourself now from yourself five years ago, you're not the same. And you can't be the same. Because lots of things have happened to you that have that have in various ways modified, have altered, in a sense are continually contributing to an elaboration or maybe an old age, a simplification mm -hmm. of the person that you are. Mm -hmm. And the person that you are is a is growing out of the cumulative sum of your experiences and how your brain is operating and, and used, of course, and the, and the massive stores of information that it's acquiring and manipulating, and, and, and the close attachments that the person that is you have with other things that become affiliated, actually associated to the personhood that is yours through powerful self-reference, right? Because I mean, you, you imagine if I get a uh, I get a new cat, uh, and I love my cat. I don't like cats. Let's use a better. I love my dog, right? And I, I suppose I look a little bit like my dog, like a lot of people do. And uh, I'm very attached to my dog, right? And in fact, my dog is identified now with my personhood. It's part of me. When my dog goes, that's why I'll feel so bad about it because actually I'm losing a little bit of me. Just like a child is powerfully attached to a parent, especially a mother really becomes part of the person that is the mother and really is part of the, it becomes part of the self because they're massively referenced to the person through self-reference millions and millions, billions of times it, through their interactions and so forth. And you so, can literally see this in the, in the structural uh, 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 geometry of the brain. Well, we see the brain referencing things that are occurring uh, together, moment by moment in time. And one thing that's consistently and repeatedly occurring over and over again for everything you do, everything you feel, everything you think, you're referencing this ac action, uh, this activity in the brain to its source. And its source is you with a capital Y, right? So you're constructing you through these massive experiences. Of course, you're biasing that, that reference as a function of how important your brain assays those moments to be. So commonly when that relates to the other people around you that are emotionally attached to you, or other events around you that are particularly powerful emotionally relate to you, those are more powerfully embedded in the person that is you. I think most people don't clearly understand that the person that, is, that resides within their skull is not a handoff. It's not a gift from somebody else. It's not, not hasn't passed down from some ancestral snake or dog. In fact, what it is, of course, is a creation of your brain. It's a, it's a product of personal evolution. Now, I've often thought if, the, if in the religious conflict between the more fundamental dimensions of religion, understood that the real challenge from science is not evolution, but personal evolution, right? Then they'd have something really much more powerful to argue about, <laughs> right? Because... From neuroscience, there's a strong indication that the person that is you, the evidence strongly suggests, comes from you. But it's a product of the plasticity of the brain in your lifetime. So what follows from that in terms of the sense of self, this sense of unity, of, of, of individuality that we have? Right. Is that well, an illusion? A, well, not, well it's, it's not an illusion. We are absolutely individual. I mean, because... Our histories are absolutely idiosyncratic. No one has, ha has your history. Right. And no one has your knowledge base. So no one can make the complex and abstract. You are irreplaceable. There's no one just like you. And there never will be, right? So that's a fabulous thing about says. it. Well, it's, it's true. Your mom is right, right? No, that's a beautiful thing about it. It's a beautiful thing about our species. Our species has developed this. And, I mean, we are the most plastic of creatures. And our species has developed in with a long childhood we have this remarkable capacity to differentiate. And in fact, we differentiate in, the, in our skills and abilities. We continue to change our brains. We continue to modify and elaborate. 
what we know, what we understand, what we can, what can, what we can do, till we die. And, and, and in fact, our knowledge base grows continuously until our 60s, 70s. And it can grow if we take good care of our brain. It can grow continuously till we, till we leave this mortal coil, exit. Now, right. there are conditions that brain tumors, example, that can totally change one's personality. Right. A, fr a friend of mine had a brain tumor. His personality right. totally changed. Right. Uh, became very promiscuous. He was very conservative before. They right. took the, discovered the tumor, took it out, back to, nor back to normal. Right. Well, that's a good outcome. Well, maybe it isn't. We'll that. <laughs> that's a good outcome. Yeah. Well, absolutely. When I mean, we have the, there are all kinds of ways in which this, these processes can be distorted. Mm -hmm. Amazingly, right? The very person can be distorted. Well, they can be. They're distorted in every normal life. You could say, have you lived in the mm -hmm. presence of of an older parent or grandparent and watched them fade away? Right. right. Watch them disappear. The person disappear in front of your eyes. They mm -hmm. literally disappear. They simplify. They go back into a reduced state that that represents a kind of shadow of their former self. I mean, that doesn't have to happen. In most older people, you can nurture and continue to grow that person that's within you, right? I mean, your brain is still plastic. You can still actually sure. improve it. But it commonly does happen. And in the same way, we see marvelous cases of people that have limited ability, that have some set of circumstances in their education and they're being nurtured at some point, in which we see this wonderful elaboration and flowering of what that person is. And we think of that person in a whole different way than we think of them. Mm -hmm before they went through that transition. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be wonderful if we understood this on a level and, and, and used this understanding on a level in which we could actually drive such marvelous things as flowers growing, blooming in our garden of society more often. So what can we then say from all of these different approaches, in, in, including the senescence of age, right. about the nature of self? Well, it, it's, it's in our hands. It arises in your brain as a function of how you use it, you can, can, you can grow it and elaborate it. Every smart person is into that business of growing and elaborate, keeping it live and vital and in there, right? And you can do that until you die, if you're lucky at all. And if you're really good at keeping, maintaining your brain fitness into old age, that's absolutely within your power. The main thing to understand is that no one is to be blamed for it. No one is to be credited for it. It's yours. You did it. And it's a product of your brain and of your life. And it's always subject to change. And it's always subject to improvement.